Hello my dears and welcome. Today is gonna be gonna be a video. Every now and then I slip into like the commentary genre with a little disability mixed in. I'm kind of here for it but like this one I watched some Andrew Tate for and that was horrifying so maybe I'm not so here for it this time around um but also I genuinely thought this video was gonna be more intel heavy than it ended up being when I started writing it so I did so much research that made me really sad that I did not need to do. But anyway, if you are new here, hi there, hello, my name is Sydney, my pronouns are they, them, I am an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. I make a lot of videos about minority media representation and accessible education, other vaguely disability related things I find interesting. I'm a white person in my early 20s with light brown, shoulder length, curly hair, and I am wearing a pink... A uh, dress with a v-neck and it it's like dark pink and it has light pink bows on it and it's short sleeve with little ruffles on it um, and then I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf and I'm super glad to have you here today you are welcome to like comment subscribe if you want absolutely no pressure either way thank you for joining me I'm super glad to have you here now today we're going to talk a little bit about incels and then like incels in connection to autism and then related to disability and accidental harm um you know that because you read the title. I'm just procrastinating talking about incels. <laughs> I always list all my sources when I make videos of all the things that I read to research for that video, but because I don't want to direct people towards incel content, I'm not going to do that for this one. That is a deliberate choice. Um, and also, honestly, the best explanations of things and the best definitions of things that I found came from the Wikipedia page, which I looked at last. So we're going to use Wikipedia as our primary source today, and it's going to be great. So. An incel, a member of an online subculture of people who define themselves as unable to get a romantic or sexual partner despite desiring one. Discussions in incel forums are often characterized by resentment and hatred, misogyny, misanthropy, self-pity and self-loathing, racism, a sense of entitlement to sex, and the endorsement of violence against women and sexually active people. Incel is a portmanteau, which is when two words get smushed together, um, of the phrase involuntary celibate. And interestingly enough, it actually began as a blog created by a young woman in the 90s as a support system for people who struggled with dating because of social awkwardness, marginalization, and or mental illness. In 2000, she gave the blog away to a stranger and it evolved mostly to become a community of people who blame women and minority people for all of their problems that is getting progressively more extremist and also some incels have taken that rhetoric off of the internet and turned it into actual real life violence, which is terrifying. Um, the incel subreddit was banned in 2017 for hate speech and it at the time had about 40,000 members, which is terrifying, um, but they then shifted to other platforms, got banned from a lot of those, and they now exist on less regulated platforms like 4chan and various dark web places. I know how the internet works. It is my job to know how the internet works, and I know everything about it. Um, there isn't really a way to tell the precise size of the incel community, and the numbers are absolutely all over the map. Estimates are anywhere from like thousands of people to hundreds of thousands of people, and an analysis of the largest incel forum recently found that only a few hundred accounts actually made up the majority of the forum posts, and I'm not sure if that's more comforting or if that's more terrifying, because like, maybe most of the people there don't even look at the content or believe those things anymore in the same way that like, I'm still in some Facebook groups about like finding colleges that I forgot about because I muted them forever ago and I also never check Facebook. Or maybe they're just so lonely and alienated that they don't even feel confident enough to post or talk to others. And even within this supposedly accepting incel community and their lack of posting is a sign that they're brooding and thinking more terrible things. So truly, who knows? This also ties into the alpha male stuff. I know we've heard so much about, it's also like, we're not going to go into the scientific whatever, but like it is so inaccurate. The study that alpha male as a concept came from is completely debunked and also just no. Um, again, I did watch some Andrew Tate for this video to understand this rhetoric. It's one of the worst things I've ever done to myself and I may never recover. Um, but there are kind of two categories of incel is what I learned. First is that there's the red pilled incel, which is a reference to the red and blue pill thing from the matrix. I feel like I feel like if you have the matrix at the core of your belief system, you have some issues, but whatever. Um, Red-pilled incels are like, this system is bad and it disadvantages us and therefore we're going to fight back against it by trying to gain wealth and popularity to be more attractive to women. Insert alpha male stuff there. And then the second is black-pilled incels who are like, the system is bad. There's nothing that I can do to change my situation. And then that teeters into like death cult territory, um, whether that is to self or to others or to a combination of the two. Because yes, incels are being labeled and treated rightfully so as a terrorist threat by Homeland Security, which is a good thing, but also 
bad that we've gotten to that point. But big explosions of violence and death cult energy aside, this ideology just is very manipulative. And that's why we're talking about it today, both in like how incels treat other people and in how they treat themselves, others within the community and how they recruit people to that community. It preys on people who are insecure and lonely and who are so used to being left out of things that they would happily throw their own personal morals aside just to be liked or they do that without realizing that they're throwing those aside. And this is human nature, all people do this or have done this on some level, but in my experience, this kind of scenario happens more to autistic people. Typically because we miss social cues, but also because we are so used to being treated terribly in general by the world, that somebody liking us or treating us semi less terribly feels worth dropping everything for. And we often will get so excited by that prospect that we hyperfixate on that person or on that community, spend all of our time with them, and then we feel so invested in that that if we get to a point where we realize that, hmm, maybe they're not the best people, or hmm, maybe this isn't a community I should be a part of, it's really hard to get ourselves out of that situation. We've talked about that before in my video about gaslighting. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, you can find it linked up here. Um, but I've also like talked about that in my videos about cultural appropriation with autism and racism with autism as well, um, in that we just like, find ourselves in situations and then we're like, ah, shoot, we need to get out of them and then we don't know how. Um, but basically what we talked about in my gaslighting video is that like leaving abusive situations, whether that's friends or workplaces or partners, is really difficult because not only have you spent a lot of time and energy on those people, but you have to process the fact that they're not all that you had hoped and dreamed that they would be. And then also you worked them into your daily life. So cutting them off means changing everything about your daily life, which in a time where you're having a hard time processing something, changing your daily routine becomes extra difficult and overwhelming. And so then you end up staying in that situation much longer than you should, which I think everybody experiences on some, on some level, but um, I, I don't wanna say there's studies in saying that autistic people are more likely to end up in those situations because it's not a direct, the studies that exist are not a direct, this is the cookie cutter situation of how that happens, but we are more likely to find ourselves in abusive situations and have a harder time getting out of them. So I think we can connect those dots together. Um, and even I, somebody who has verbalized this whole phenomenon in videos and conversations several times before about finding yourself in social situations and feeling loved and feeling wanted and throwing away your morals to be a part of that group and then realizing it and then trying to get out and having a hard time doing that, I still find myself in this situation. <coughs> Curious sense of it, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that autistic people can often be more vulnerable to being taken advantage of. Not saying that we aren't consenting humans who can speak up for ourselves because we very much are. Um, and I'm also not saying that every relationship or friendship autistic people are in is toxic or manipulative or unhealthy because that is also so very often not the case. I'm simply trying to say that we can often find ourselves in social situations with people who aren't nice people or say not so nice things and aren't quite sure how we got there. And sometimes we're aware in the moment that they aren't nice and are trying to figure out how to get out of there and other times they're the only people we spend time with and so we have no frame of reference to realize that they aren't nice and we may defend them and defend their behaviors to the ends of the earth until we finally get space from them and we realize that we were really going way out of our way to try to explain why they were in the right in certain circumstances where they objectively were being not nice people <coughs> curious sensitive <coughs> <coughs> sorry uh pollen allergies yeah, anywho, where I'm going with this is that the incel community is really good at manipulating autistic people into thinking that their alienation in an ableist society is because women suck. Um, they also offer a clear sort of social rule book. Like if you follow these specific social norms that you can learn by paying Andrew Tate an exorbitant amount of money, you can be successful. And if you become super rich, women are going to like you and then you're going to be happy. And they're a community that says, hey, we see your loneliness, we see your sadness, and we want you to know that, that is not your fault. That is society's fault particularly the women in that society, because they have all of those rights now that they didn't have before. And while right now you are, you know, weak and a subhuman beta male, you can fix that by becoming an alpha male and by doing all of these steps, X, Y, and Z, and then you'll become superior to everybody else and universally liked like all other alpha, alpha males, which is inherently attractive to people. It's giving you a step-by-step -step guide and answers on how to do a better job. And like, as much as I disagree with incel culture and behavior and whatnot, I understand the desire to be in a community that is accepting, that says that you are worthy, that one that gives you the tools to be a better version of yourself and one that points out that a lot of your problems are structural and not personal individual issues. Because on some level, this is about to sound terrible, but stick with me here. Is that not what we look for in our minority affinity spaces as well? 
right? And when it comes down to mental health in the incel community, many incels talk about mental health issues and self-diagnosis in the same ways that non-incels do as well. One study from 2022 found that people who identified as part of the incel community had higher rates of depression, 95% of them, uh, higher rates of anxiety, which is 93%, and formal mental diagnoses than the general population at 38%. But the thing is, many members of the community directly discourage members from seeing therapists or seeking help. I'm assuming they probably frame it as some something around the idea of manliness or self-sufficiency or independence or whatever, but it is also an isolation tactic to keep people in the community, kind of like the quiet kid who gets dragged into the group of mean girls is told to never speak to anybody else because if she starts to outsource or gain a voice, she becomes a threat to the power and control of the entire group. Now, there is an inherent fear of discussing the incel community as one that is so heavily neurodivergent and mentally ill because people don't want people to start thinking that all neurodivergent people are incels, which is a very valid concern. First, because there's the whole societal all mentally ill people are inherently dangerous misconception thing going on that is very much perpetuated by this narrative. Um, and then the second societal like mentally ill people are just ill. They don't mean what they're doing and we should, you know, let them off for bad behavior thing, which is more nuanced because yes, we shouldn't inherently describe discriminate against or permanently punish people because they are mentally disabled, but at the same time, to quote one of my closest friends, you can still suck outside of your neurodivergence. For autism in particular, there's this idea that we are just innocent angel babies who are morally perfect and have a strong sense of justice. And while yes, we are statistically more likely than the general population to have a very strong sense of justice and make action toward writing things, that does not mean that said perceived injustice is inherently morally good. To put that more simply, say that I was doing a show in a building that could only be entered by going up a flight of stairs. That is not ADA compliant and it means that some of my friends would either not be able to see me in the show at all or they would but that would involve putting themselves at physical risk or in literal danger to do so. So I start fighting for the owners of that building to do something about it and they agree to put up a temporary ramp until they can gather the funds to build a more sustainable one in the next year. At the same time, another person in that show really loves architecture and upon seeing the temporary ramp becomes irate that the architectural integrity of the building has been disrupted by the addition of the ramp. They try to argue that it's not necessary, that it's ugly and it should be taken down because because no ramp users would bother to come to our show anyway, and the building needs to stay historically accurate. Both of us feel like we are fighting an inherent injustice and we will keep on fighting for that thing as long as we possibly can because boy are we both stubborn, but also one of those things is inherently furthering bigotry and hate while the other is making things more inclusive. Another great example of this is the time that House in House MD refuses to go into his office until he gets his bloodstained carpet put back in there because it's his and that's how his office should be and he can't work in an office that looks different. Meanwhile, Cuddy is like, um, that's a health hazard and you're being petty and no. Like that's less of a bigotry thing. It's a more health and safety concern thing, but they're both fighting for things that they very, they very much believe are the right thing to do. Um, but there is from the outside objectively a right and a wrong perspective, if that makes sense. Just because you have a stronger propensity towards social justice does not mean that said justice is actually justice, which is one of the reasons that the idea that people in power are inherently neurotypical is so frustrating to me because in my experience, they are often equally as stubborn about things just in a misguided direction. And often the people that I have the most trouble with are the most autistic coded people I've ever met. And it's a very interesting dynamic in that we are at higher risk for being targeted victims of manipulation and harm, but at the same time, we still also hold power over other people and are just as likely to cause harm as anybody else and may not even realize it, which can often end up in accidentally perpetuating the harm that has been done to us, just manifested in a different way because of how much we focus on not doing that one thing again that we neglect the other people pieces of that harm. And then we think that we can't have perpetuated that same harm because it's been done to us and so we know better and anybody saying that they were harmed by us in a certain way does not know what they're really talking about because we tried really hard to not do that so therefore we couldn't have. Which leads us to the accidental harm situation that is the actual censure of this video. What I mean to say when I say accidental harm is the things that people may not realize that they are doing that hurt other people. Even if intentions are great or just neutral, they can cause serious harm. For a large example of this, I once had a partner who thought they were doing everything to love and support me with my disabilities. Meanwhile, that love and support gave me a brain injury. And then they told me years after it wasn't abuse because they didn't mean it, which in case you didn't know, is not how that works. Um, and that's tricky because the idea of taking responsibility for actions and hurt caused is a difficult one to quantify, particularly when for a lot of marginalized people that often will leave us apologizing um, profusely for other people's unwillingness to handle change or to talk to minority people or treat other people like human beings. And that is not ideal because we should not be apologizing for our minority status. The amount of times that I have apologized just for being disabled, I literally told a professor, <laughs> 
Okay, I had a professor who was continuously lying to me a few months ago, and I literally told the professor, I'm sorry, it's actually my fault because I have memory loss, and um, that still keeps me up at night. Particularly because I later found that I had kept track of everything, and he was in fact lying to me, and I had tons of proof, but at that point it was too late, and I'm just like, I shouldn't have apologized for being, like, what? No, a lot of taking responsibility for actions for minority people can just be apologizing for who we are, and specifically the aspects of ourselves that exist because we are in a minority and therefore not typical. But this has become more widely noted over time, particularly with discussions of the fact that equality feels like oppression to privileged people, um, and there has been a stronger push for minority people to not apologize for who they are, and instead go like, I am this way because of my identity and you need to be accepting of that. Which on the surface is so awesome and definitely like that is the primary thing that we should be doing. Mentally disabled people should not have to change who they are to fit a neurotypical norm, whatever that is, those don't really exist, but you know what I mean, or to be palatable to other people. There's a whole culture of your mental illness isn't an excuse get yourself together that this can tip into really easily, that ideology is super harmful and super gross because disabilities are not excuses. They are explanations as to why certain norms don't quite work and certain things need to be changed and challenged. Or like, because of my disability, this is genuinely dangerous for me. That's not an excuse. That is a, that is a safety thing. But then at the same time, Mental disability or any other minority status does not give somebody a free pass to be an abuser or misogynistic or racist or anything else. And to explain that in a slightly different way, let's look at this TikTok as an example. People say I'm a flirt, but I'm actually just love bombing and mirroring to gain control of them. People call me a flirt, but I'm actually just masking my symptoms by mirroring the behaviors, movements, and accents. It also seems like I flirt with everyone just because I'm extremely empathetic. I'm intentionally ignoring my partner to further my little game of manipulation. Oh, I just got hyper fixated on painting this box and I forgot my partner existed. I spark random arguments with my partner to lower their self-esteem while increasing mine. Oh, I sometimes just spark random arguments because I'm understimulated and bored. I try to find out extremely personal details about a person really fast in the relationship so I can use it against them later on. Oh, I speed up the relationship and come on way too strong at the beginning because I get hyper fixated on the person. I never take accountability or responsibility for my own actions because I can't be wrong. I actually over apologize and take accountability for things that I didn't even do. Now on the surface, this is fine. The general point of it is saying like, you're not inherently manipulative or a controlling person because of the certain ways you may act, it may just be an ADHD thing, and that your intentions are great, so you don't need to be anxious about that. Also, this is a creator whose ADHD content usually slips into the autistic or autistic ADHD profile content, but it's still listed as solely ADHD. That's not a discussion for today. Um, let's talk about some other concerns about this. No shade or hate towards this creator, by the way. Please do not find him, please do not spam his comments or anything. I'm not here to judge. A lot of his content's really awesome. We're just here to use a short form piece that inherently needs to lack nuance due to the demands of the platform in order to have a more nuanced conversation. So the first thing is here is the term narcissist. I hate it. I've complained about it before. While I take issue with the existence of personality disorders to begin with, they do exist. And using narcissist as a word that inherently means evil, terrible, no good, very bad, we are automatically stigmatizing everybody with NPD, both as abusers and as abusers who deliberately mean what they're doing. The second thing is the comment section of this video is full of people going, oh, my last partner accused me of being a narcissistic abuser and this makes me feel so much better about myself. Or I've been afraid of becoming a narcissist like my parent and this brings me so much peace. Or my last partner was abusive, but now I realize it was just that he has ADHD, so I called him up and we're gonna try to make it work. And um, remember my story earlier about my abuser who didn't realize that they were abusing me until I got a brain injury and they still deny it? Yeah. Um, so the unfortunate truth is that most abusers don't mean to be abusers and don't realize that they're doing it. People do not wake up in the morning and go, wow, I'm going to abuse or control my partner today. Like that is not something like the majority of people don't think that way and they will abuse without realizing that they're doing it. And that does not mean that people cannot learn or change or grow. It does not mean that people do not deserve second chances. And, and it also does not mean that people are doomed to be abusers just that we have a tendency to say, yeah, I get they make you absolutely miserable, but like, do they really mean it? They probably just can't help it. And then that leads us down a really dark rabbit hole of defending seriously egregious behavior because just because it's an accident does not mean that it doesn't really hurt others and that those people deserve to be treated kindly and not be miserable, which does not mean changing who you are to cater to other people. It means communicating properly and recognizing when you're causing harm. A great example of this is love bombing. If you don't know what that is, it's a manipulation tactic where somebody puts in a lot of effort into a relationship, usually the beginning, showering their partner with gifts and quality time and love and everything they'd ever imagined. And then later they pull away, they become more controlling and they use that honeymoon time to point back to and go, see, look at everything I did for you. See how happy you were? The fact that we're miserable right now is your fault. 
And for a lot of ADHD and autistic people, we get super excited at the start of a relationship, and this goes for friendships as well. And we'll spend all of our time, all of our money on this person because they're new and exciting and they're all we can think about because they're a hyperfixation. And then over time, we start to relax into it and then we start to set boundaries, and that can look like we're love bombing and then pulling away, and that is a red flag for a lot of people, which is valid. And this is also why it's important to have the verbiage for these kinds of things. Like, I pay attention to it, and when I find myself in new friendships, I will call myself out specifically and be like, this is how I function in friendships so that people don't read my behavior as an inherent manipulation tactic. They might still feel put off by it, but at least they understand why that's happening and then we can have conversations and communication as to why they might feel that way and why I feel the way that I do and find a way to move forward that feels healthiest and safest for both parties. And that's not changing who I am to fit a mold for other people or apologizing for my disability. It's just being a decent human being and communicating wants and needs with other human beings so that everybody is the happiest um, and the most them that they can be. The thing is that this involves self-awareness, which is inherently a struggle for a lot of neurodiversities. It also involves clear verbal feedback and a willingness to actually listen to that feedback, both of which often don't happen as well. Most feedback involves nonverbal cues that are not the most helpful for someone who struggles to read nonverbal cues. Whether they miss those cues or they misread those cues and assume that they mean terrible things even when the cues don't and therefore had to override their own anxiety system in order to ignore all nonverbal cues, because I am somehow both. An example of this that I come across the most is in neurodivergent affinity spaces. Most neurodivergent affinity spaces that I've been in are primarily male dominated, specifically by white men in their early 30s. So I, as a femme presenting young trans person walking into these spaces, am completely unable to relax. I have spent my whole life being told that because I am pretty, men will try to take advantage of me, and that because I'm autistic, I miss social cues and I can never tell when people are flirting with me, and so I therefore need to be extra careful around men and always assume that they have bad intentions. And we're gonna ignore the gender binary situation right now because I'm out of the binary, but this is how I was raised. And it doesn't mean that I am incapable of trusting men, just more that I always keep my guard up. So having one me in a space with six white older men all trying to talk to me at the exact same time and starting to get mad at each other over me is really weird and really uncomfortable. And I also often get misgendered way more in those spaces, no matter how masculine I try to come across. Believe me, I've tried because people see me as a girl, particularly people who are looking for relationships. And in one of these spaces, I was frustrated that I didn't feel safe in what was supposed to be my safe space as a neurodivergent person, but I also understand demographically why this is the case and that there wasn't much I could potentially do about it. So I just like got over it and then just kind of didn't go back. However, when talking to a friend about it, I learned that this had been a consistent problem. The person in charge of the space had been told on several occasions about that and about how this was not a place that was safe for women or people of color and was directly given advice on how to work on making it more inclusive and safe. And he had consistently ignored all of that and said that because he is a neurodivergent person, um, he knows better than they do about accessible and inclusive neurodivergent spaces and left things as they were, which is when it flips from a simple privileged blind spot of accidental harm into active and deliberate harm because you're not willing to listen to a minority people telling you that you have an issue and that maybe you should fix it. No matter the intentions, this refusal to listen to minority people who are concerned about safety and inclusion has caused and will further cause harm. This phenomenon is very fascinating to me, particularly because the autistic community online is so full of young people and full of trans people and full of like, it is the demographics in, in like autistic groups or neurodivergent groups that primarily skew autistic in the world tend to just be or mostly be older cis white men, which then makes the young trans and AFAB people and people of color feel unwelcome there because of our track records with cis white men in the past, both individually and like as our minorities with generational trauma, which pushes us more online. It's super fascinating, but also it's very nuanced. We have spoken about creepiness before on this channel, um, but research into what is considered creepy is basically anything that is different or unexpected, which means that minority people are inherently going to be seen as creepier or scarier. And that's why we should take the time to confront why we may feel uncomfortable. Is that warranted or is it internalized biases that we further encourage by putting this person in the same category of creepiness? But then at the same time, once you make that call, if you feel generally unsafe or uncomfortable, you have every single reason to feel that way. There's also the aspect that autistic people often find other autistic people to be more creepy than non-autistic people would find those people because due to trauma, our guards are up higher than the general public in new social situations because we know that we miss social cues. And therefore, we can outwardly seem less accepting of other autistic people. But also then there's privilege within our community itself. If you feel uncomfortable or creeped out by a non-speaking person or an autistic person of color or a higher support needs autistic person that is less a trauma thing and more of a privilege thing that you should probably reflect upon. 
When a 33-year-old white autistic man who is your coworker flirts with a 21-year-old you by complaining about his ex-wife and then giving you his number and forcing you to text him in front of you so that he knows that it's a real number, even when you try every single tactic, including so saying no several times to, to get out of that, and then having him walk you back to your car, you have every right to feel uncomfortable. Which then makes it extra frustrating when you learn later that this person has a track record of doing this to people, and it has been reported to the person in charge of that space, and he just ignores is it. Sure, the person doing that probably didn't realize he was making me uncomfortable or making me feel unsafe, and he was probably just like, oh, this is a new friend that I'm making. But given the social power dynamic at play there, I felt very unsafe. And I did try to directly communicate that with him in several different ways. And also just in general, a 33 year old should not be flirting with a 21 year old who made it very clear that they are 21 and also a lesbian. Listening back to this um, as I'm editing, I'm, it didn't even cross my mind, but also, there's the fact that a lot of neurodivergent communication methods just come across as flirting when they don't mean to be doing that. Like, neurodivergent people, particularly autistic people, flirt by accident all the time. So he might not even have meant to be flirting with me, but the way that he was interacting with me made me feel like it was flirting and made me very uncomfortable. And that is difficult. Um, but again, like, I want to be... I said they're like, oh, he should know that like a 33 year old should not be flirting with a 21 year old. But he genuinely might not have thought that he was flirting. He maybe thought that he was just like making a new friend and didn't realize. Um, and so this again points to the fact that there were a lot of bystanders in that situation who watched this happen, who watched me try to say no, who watched me vis be visibly uncomfortable and did not say anything and did not step in and that and did not point this out to this person, um, which is kind of a wider wider problem that I'm trying to point to with this video. And given the thing that he was saying about his ex-wife, it is very clear that he's been given this feedback before by other people and directly chooses to ignore it. Another example of this is an autistic person my age who regularly followed me places to try to have conversations with me. I had regularly told them before that this behavior made me feel very uncomfortable because it was very much stalking and I requested that they leave me alone and I would still find them just like randomly in my hallway when I would go to brush my teeth or they would just wait in the entrance of the dining hall until I left to follow me home to the point where I had several alternate routes planned in my head of long ways home and became afraid to leave my room for days at a time. The fact that I had continuously communicated to this person to stop following me and their response was that they're autistic and they struggle with social cues is a problem because I too am autistic and struggle with social cues. I also do not follow people home on the regular. And even if that's not something that this person had picked up on as a thing that you socially don't do, fine. But if that person then says on several occasions, hey, please stop doing this, I'm setting a boundary and you're making me feel unsafe, I'm gonna listen and do that thing. And it is the responsibility of that person to have listened and do that thing and stop stalking me. And I get, it. as humans, we ignore bad things that people say about us to protect our self-esteem. And often as neurodivergent people, the things that are frequently said, the things that are a consistent pattern, tend to be the ones that are important parts of who we are as neurodivergent people. And therefore we discard them and we explain them away. But tying this back to incels again, the incel rhetoric of, well, women say stuff to us about how we're a problem, but that's just a part of who we are. It's something that we're proud of and it's something that somebody will like us for and other people won't and those people suck. And just because they're proud of who they are does not mean that they are not still actively causing active harm by acting that way. And that is a very clear and extreme example of where people in a vulnerable place try to work on themselves, often with the best of intentions, and then find themselves instead perpetuating harm, which is why that's the example that we're kind of using here. And it's difficult because we cannot expect people whose number one struggle is self-awareness to be fully self-aware. That's kind of an absurd expectation. And we also cannot expect other people to consistently and clearly communicate their feedback to us for us to learn from either. That's not a social norm that kind of exists in society. And we also need to be careful to not get to a point where we second guess every single thing that we do and become absolutely stuck in our own anxiety about accidentally harming people because regardless of, like, regardless of neurotype, people hurt people by accident and on purpose literally all of the time. It happens. So what's important is taking responsibility for that, acknowledging that intention does not equal impact. And if you hurt somebody, you're not doomed forever. You're not a terrible person. And you also don't need to change yourself to make people in the majority feel more comfortable around you. The problem is when your behavior as a privileged minority makes other minority people feel uncomfortable. And particularly when you've been given consistent feedback on doing something about that and choose to ignore it. Because I get people not understanding these things or missing these things. But a lot of times when I am having an issue with somebody about a specific behavior, I then learn from other people 
that they have been reprimanded on that behavior in a lot of cases, sometimes even like by bosses at jobs, not just like a friend situation. And I'm like, okay, at that point then, I'm not going, I'm still gonna like forgive you, give the benefit of the doubt that you don't understand whatever, but I'm gonna have a harder time doing that because you have been given the chances to learn and grow and you have chosen to deliberately not take them. We also need to stop excusing things like sexism, ableism, and racism just because somebody is mentally disabled and doesn't know any better because that gets super infantilizing and super dangerous super quickly. Again, not saying people can't do things by accident and that their disability may play a part in that, but being disabled does not give somebody the inherent right to be an abuser either. That's just not how that works. Hey, remember that time in Atypical that Sam assaulted a woman and then got a churro after because it was no big deal? Impossible to outrun the mosquito. Assault! And then five minutes later... I bought these churros with my own money, so you can't have one. Please don't ask. Hey! I didn't ask. And this was already after he decided that he was in love with his therapist, so he stalked her, broke into her house, and left a chocolate strawberry underneath her couch. But it's before he locked his girlfriend in a closet because she was annoying him. That's the biggest issue I have always had with Atypical. It normalizes misogyny and abuse done by autistic men and excuses it just on the basis of them being autistic. Being autistic does not give you a free pass to violate women's boundaries and put us in danger. Basically that, just all, all of that, <laughs> that whole TikTok is what inspired this video to begin with. Allies in particular who have the energy and capacity, when you see something like this happening, say something very clearly, give people feedback. Because yes, it is our responsibility to be self-aware enough to not inflict harm. But there are also going to be times when we don't realize that it's harm because it's what we've always done and nobody has given us direct feedback about it before. And there's also the aspect of those people who are directly harmed by us may not feel comfortable coming back to tell us, I feel harmed and this is how you have harmed me. And that is, we shouldn't expect that from people. If you've been traumatized by something, like I have spoken to my abuser about how I've been treated and it made me sick for three weeks because I was so exhausted from that interaction and they're not changing or growing from that conversation. And I think that if somebody else had brought my concerns to them, somebody else who was in the situation who had seen what was going down had gone to them that would have saved me, you know, and then they would have still gotten that feedback. And that is what has since happened. Um, but that's just like, it is not a person who's harmed responsibility to help the person who harmed them to become a better person. We do not need to do that. Um, and so that is another reason why bystanders, it is your responsibility to, if you notice something, say something, point it out, try to help other people. Or like, if you think that somebody else has been harmed, check in on them and say, hey, are you okay? I've personally seen a lot of people lately use their disabilities to say that they can't be ableist or rude or hurt people. And that's just not how it works. And also like, if you need to use an extensive list of excuses as to why you're not causing harm to people, maybe you should reevaluate that one because privilege still exists within the disability community and also within the world in general. So pay attention to it. This video is not to scare people, but more to like have a conversation about how Things we do have impacts, even if the intentions are good, because I see so frequently people being like, but I didn't mean it, so therefore, no. Whether you meant it or not, if somebody feels like they're being stalked, that they are being harassed, that they are being attacked, that they feel unsafe to leave their homes, whatever, that whether you meant it as a nice friendly gesture or not, you have caused harm and it is your responsibility to at least acknowledge that, you know? And in regards to the incel stuff and the idea of like being taken advantage of by harmful communities without realizing it because of how grateful you are to have community, we've all been there. Um, I highly recommend learning de-escalation and like how to get away from negative conversation skills, um, as well as learning about various signs of abuse and gaslighting, which I have a video about that's already in the card um, and it's gonna be in the description as well for you. Um, yeah, I will also say that sometimes we screw up and we hurt people and those people will never forgive us and they're not obligated to. Um, and that's okay. All we can do is we can learn and we can grow from that experience and move forward as better people from there. I will say, I watched a video by uh, Khadija who, if you don't follow Khadija, you, you all should subscribe to their channel because they're incredible. Um, <laughs> but um, it's about uh, sincere apologies and the psychology of apologies and stuff like that. And they specifically talked about how there was a case of somebody who they d didn't feel like they wanted an apology from their abuser, but then they got one where their abuser directly acknowledged the, all of these things did happen. I did perpetuate these ideas. I did harm you in this way. And I know that this is what your experience was and I want to apologize. And while I didn't mean it that way, I understand why you felt that way. And I am really sorry for the harm that that caused because on one level, like 
there's the idea of, oh, they've been traumatized by me, they don't want to hear my apology, whatever. But also, like, having somebody who has caused you serious harm go, hey, the thing that the entire world has been gaslighting you about and telling you didn't exist and that you're making it up, it did happen because I was there and I perpetuated that and I am sorry, um, can mean a whole lot. So knowing when to just completely leave somebody be and just move on and do a better job as changing as a person versus doing a solid apology and then moving on, you know, do with that what you will. But I did want to just put both of those things out there. Anyway, this video ended up being a whole lot more deep than I expected it to. Also way more hot take heavy than expected, but it is a conversation that I've been having a lot over the past few months and figured I would try to organize my thoughts into a video for you all, which made me realize that my thoughts are way less organized and way less cut and dry as I thought that they were gonna be. But I think that's the marker of a good nuanced conversation. I'm rambling. Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. Um, and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.